Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Canada. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I'd like to start by saying I get really weirded out by these video introductions, but uh, inshallah I'll try to orient myself. Uh, I was actually asked what topic I'd like to speak on, and uh, I gave it some thought and I actually picked this passage myself. One of the most difficult and most uh, profound and beautiful passages of the entire Qur'an, the parable of light, that begins with the remarkable ayah, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Many of you are familiar with the ayat, Allah is the light of the skies and the earth, how it's roughly translated. And I do want to talk about these ayat with you in the next few minutes that I have with you. But before I do, I want to share something about my approach. And just the, cogn just the recognition that I have of the time and place and the audience that I'm speaking to. In my experience, the Book of Allah can be studied at many different depths. And there is no end to the depth of the Book of Allah. There's actually, I've, after trying to understand this book for the last, more than the last decade, I've come to the conclusion that even one ayah, you can only understand some things about it. And even then, you will come across those who have reflected on it and thought about it deep, deeply, and have had to say things, and you look at the same ayah and you realize you never actually knew this ayah like they did, you know, and so there's no end to the depth and there's no end really to the wisdom that is captured inside every single ayah of Allah Azza wa Jal's beautiful and perfect book. But at the same time, there's the other end of the, the spectrum. The Muslims, I feel for the most part, uh, are suffering from many tragedies and one of them is a distance from Allah's book. On the one hand, you have this approach to the Qur'an where you just read a translation and you assume that that is all it has to offer, which is a tragedy. I don't think it's fair for us to think that we've read a translation of the Qur'an and assume that we actually understand what Allah Azza wa Jal has to tell us. What Allah has to tell us is far more profound, far deeper and far more beautiful than any human attempt at trying to even explain it, much less translate it. That's not even possible. So on the one hand, you have this tragedy of so many Muslims underestimating the value and the power and the beauty of the Qur'an. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have people that are, that are trying to understand the Book of Allah and trying to study it in more depth. But when they present it to people, when they teach it to people, or at least try, they teach it in such a difficult way, in such a technical way that people just... Whew, Nothing, what is he talking about? He just quoted like 80 different scholars and talked about some grammatical stuff and some roots of this or that or the other, but I don't get it. I don't know what he's talking about. And then people come out of that kind of a lecture saying, man, that was deep. And then you say, what did he talk about? I don't know, but it was deep, man. That was deep. <laughs> you know. So I find myself in a very perplexed situation. On the one hand, these are profoundly beautiful, deep ayat. And even the whatever little I've been able to study is really for me sometimes too deep. I have to sit back, take a break. Wallahi, when I, sometimes I decide to study a passage of the Qur'an seriously, and I'll spend a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months on a few set of ayat. I'm reading a tafsir or taking some notes or listening to a scholar or just writing some things down. I get to a point where it gets so overwhelming for me that I just have to stop and go and like play with my kids and play a video game or something. Get it out of my head because it's overwhelming. It really is overwhelming. And so I, you know, this is one of those lectures where I'm overwhelmed about what to share with you and what to hold back. Obviously cognizant of the fact that there are children in our audience. There are young people in our audience. There are people in our audience that have no background in the Arabic language or they don't even know what the word tafsir means and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. But even they need, they deserve to hear something about the Quran. They, need, they deserve to hear something about what makes it so beautiful. So I'm gonna try. I don't promise you anything. I do not give you any guarantees at all. I mean, I am expecting a colossal disappointment here. But still, you know, people say, I'm looking forward to your speech. I was like, you're looking forward to the wrong thing. But, you know, but let's, let's try to get at least some things that I've been able to grasp and some lessons that I, I think will, you'll find very beautiful too in this 
one of the most beautiful passages in the Quran. And at first, why did I choose this passage? I chose this passage inspired by many, many, many conversations with young Muslims from all over the world that are having a crisis of faith. They're just suffering a crisis of faith. Ustad Norman, I'm having some doubts. Ustad Noman, I'm not so sure. Ustad Noman, why does Allah talk about hellfire so much in the Quran? Ustad Noman, why? How come He says this in the Quran? I'm disturbed by that. Yeah, you know, why is Allah going to do this or that or the other? Why is this happening to me? And people are, they have these questions, these really deep questions. And these are questions being asked by 14 year olds. And it's shocking sometimes, like, dude, you haven't even taken a philosophy class yet. Thank you, YouTube. Right? So our kids are, young kids are exposed to these philosophical crises on top of the, all the other chaos in their lives, not to mention the disintegration of the basic family unit where parents don't know what it means to be parents anymore. We don't know what it means to have a regular conversation with our children anymore. We don't do this stuff. We don't, and we don't actually assume that our children are going to have major crises of faith in their young years. We assume their Islam is going to be on autopilot. But when they get to that point and they start asking their parents some tough questions, a lot of us parents, we just kind of panic. We're like, oh, there's some kind of shaitan possessing this child. Go take him to the imam and the imam is going to be like, <laughs> and then it's going to be gone. But this kid's problems have not gone away. He's got more questions and more questions and more questions. And yes, it is a fact that almost all of the conversations I've had with young people about their crisis of faith, it has boiled down to a combination of two things. On the one hand, at the core of it, there is a spiritual problem. At the heart of it, there is a spiritual disease, which is then wrapped with an intellectual confusion. But at the heart of it, there is still that spiritual problem. And I don't, I don't diminish or ridicule the intellectual problem, I don't. I think they both need to be addressed. But we need to understand and diagnose the problem first, before we offer medication. So when, you, when our kids start having these kinds of crises, and we take them to, you know, to do some ruqya on them or something, we're attempting to solve possibly a spiritual problem. But have no, given no respect or no credence to the fact that there may be an intellectual problem as well. There may be a psychological problem as well. And so I think this is one of those places in the Qur'an that is so important, that everybody should understand so, so well. This passage to me, you know what it did for me when I was a student in college? This was the passage that told me who I was. I was a student of psychology. And when I was studying psychology, there's one thing in psychology studies that there's no agreement on. You know what it is? Personality. The definition of personality. What is it? Oh my God, you've done a PhD in psychology, which is all of it is the study of the human personality. And the one thing we haven't figured out yet is what? What is personality? Subhanallah. Allah says this so articulately in the Quran. He says, Yes, Alunaka ani ruh, kuli ruhu min amri rabbi, wa ma uti tum min al ilmi illa kalilan. They ask you about the ruh. They tell them the ruh is from the commandment of my master. You haven't been given except very, very little. Whatever we can figure out even about ourselves is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, you know what? Allah revealed to us something about ourselves that you could not have found in philosophy and you could not have found in psychology. This can only have come from Allah. And when I started seeing myself, pun intended, in light of these ayat, when I started seeing myself in light of these ayat, I figured stuff out about myself that I couldn't have figured out on my own. Really, I started looking at myself differently. And I hope I can do some of that for you today, even though my time's really, really short. Let's begin, inshaAllah ta'ala. Allah begins by saying, calling Himself the light of the skies and the earth. And many ulama have commented on the fact that this is actually a parable. Meaning, you can think of Allah like you think of light for the skies and the earth. Now what does that parable mean? First of all, the parable is so strong that there is no adatu tashbih, there is no device used to call it a parable. This is done in the Arabic language when two things are very comparable, when there's a very close association. So Allah wants us to deeply reflect and think about the concept of light, to think about light. So I'll say a few things about light. If there is no light, then doesn't matter how beautiful the universe is, we see nothing. Doesn't matter if you and I have both eyes. Our eyes are useless without the presence of what? Light. 
reality as we know it around us is actually irrelevant entirely. All we have around us then is darkness and nothing. And incidentally, we know now that light isn't just a means by which we can see, light is a fundamental to life on this earth. Without light, you don't get plants. And without plants, you don't have life. Life is, light is essential to life. And it's interesting that in the world, the places in the world, geographically speaking, that have the least amount of sunlight, the places in the world that are really gloomy and dark and cloudy, <laughs> Europe, um, have the highest levels of depression in the world. People don't enjoy their life. They, they're miserable and cynical and dark. It's weird that in, you know, in a city that is as well off as Seattle, Washington, a well off, a beautiful city covered in mountains, it's gorgeous, has one of the highest suicide rates in America. And many psychologists are trying to attribute it to the rains all the time and it's always dark and there's not enough sun. They get sun like maybe a couple of weeks in the year. So, SubhanAllah, what a powerful parable. So now let's think about this light. There are two things. In the Arabic language, by the way, one of the words for eyes themselves is nur. Vision itself is also called nur. So in order for us to appreciate vision, to see reality around us, there are two things necessary. This light, the light inside of you, the light of your eyes, nurul ayn, and also you need light outside. A light inside and a light outside. If any one of those is missing, you're as good as blind. Isn't that clear? Is that simple enough for everybody? Okay. Now let's take it a step further. This is physical light. What I just talked about is physical light. But Allah is telling us something about spiritual light by making us think about physical light because they're similar. Now in the spiritual sense, there's a light inside of us. It's not here, it's here. There's a light Allah poured inside of us. When I was inside my mom's belly, then an angel was delivered to put some light inside of her. That would be something I would be pre-programmed with. All of you, the ruh is a form of light that is inside of us. There's a light inside of us. But that light on its own can only see so much until, there, until there's what? Light on the outside, right? There has to be light on the outside. So now what is that light on the outside? Allah Azza wa Jal describes His book. He describes his book and he says, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا Believe in Allah and His Messenger and the light that we've sent down. Just like there are two ingredients to physical light, there are two ingredients to spiritual light. The human being has a yearning inside of him and her. They have, we have this light inside of us that wants something. It's looking for some kind of perfection because it came from a perfect source. So when revelation comes, when the word of Allah comes, when the teachings of His Prophet comes وسلم, then they complete that light inside. This is the passage about these two lights meeting each other. So Allah says, and actually before I go further, I need some, some more things to talk to you about. Oh man, this passage. You know, right now we're inside this indoors hall and there are these funky artificial lights. They're pretty cool, but we got these lights inside and we need these lights. If this is not on, then it doesn't matter if it's day outside, we are completely blacked out. At nighttime, imagine what this, the electricity bill for one city is. Just imagine, forget one building, an entire city, how much energy is spent to keep the lights on at night. Incredible, isn't it? Just think, absolutely mind-boggling how much energy is exhausted by human effort to put light when the sun's light goes away. Now Allah has a lamp, the sun. Allah created His light. And then we have our light. When Allah takes His lamp down, when the sun goes down, then you and I have to struggle to turn our lamps on. Back in the day, the lantern. You got to turn the lights on, switch the bulbs, right? We got to do all of that. And as best as we can do, can we simulate His light? Is it as good as the light He gives us in the day? No. Mm -mm. Subhanallah. You can try to come up with whatever you can, but as much as you will, your light will be limited and overwhelmingly the world will be surrounded by darkness. And yet when Allah brings His light, when He brings the sun out, what happens? They say in Arabic, أَغْنَى الصَّبَاحَ عَنِ الْمِسْبَاحَ that the lamp made the, 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 the morning made the lamp irrelevant. You, your light and my light, does, keeping the lights on in the morning, especially if you're this, so you'd never do it actually. You don't even turn them on at nighttime. But anyway, you definitely wouldn't turn them on in the day. Because the sun's enough. 
just open the window, move the curtains, the sunlight is enough. It'll light everything else up. In other words, Allah's light is overwhelming and undeniable. There's no escape from it. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And so we're beginning with something. I have my concept of light. I have my struggles towards light. My limited light. But Allah's light is it's just limitless. I can't even compare. And it comes from such a much higher source. It's a much more powerful source. Now he says, let me help you understand this parable a little better. Allah Azza wa takes us deeper and deeper and deeper. He says, مَثَلُ نُورِهِ كَمِشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مِسْبَاح The example of his light, if you want to think about it, is like an indent. Now, we don't have those much anymore. Actually, in Texas, where I come from, we actually have those. But in modern homes, you have tube lights, and you have bulbs, and you have chandeliers. But back in the day, they didn't have running electricity. So what they used to have to do in homes, is they would put a little arch, like this, this curved arch, in the indent of a wall. So they could put a lamp in there. And they made this arch, so that when, the, when you put a lamp in there and you turn it on, the light hits the back of the arch and spreads to the rest of the room. So they designed it in a way that it would capture the light and then spread the light. That's the purpose of it. And it's shaped kind of like this. Like the door of a classical masjid or something. When you know, Sunday school kids draw a masjid, they draw a door like that. That's what an arch looks like. That's a mishkat, basically. Now Allah says, the example of Allah's light, if you want to think about it, in one way of it, it's like a lamp inside a niche. And so, fiha misbah, in it there's a misbah. And interestingly, even the word misbah, which is called an ism ala in the Arabic language, it comes from the word subh. I know, hunaka Arab, mashallah, fil majlis, madha yani subh, what does subh mean? It means morning. This is subah ha, mare paas bhi hai, wo Yes, yes, I know. Thank you. Congratulations. You know word of Arabic. Okay. So subah, misbah is actually a tool that simulates the morning. It tries to do what the morning is supposed to do. That's where you get the word misbah from. Okay. And it creates an aware awareness and alertness. That's why in old Arabic, another way of saying intabih is asbih. Another way of saying pay attention in old Arabic is actually to say asbih. Which actually doesn't just mean wake up, it means pay attention. In other words, obviously if you want to be alert to your surroundings, you need to have something that produces light. Anyway, moving along with this beautiful parable. There's an arch in the home, there's a lamp inside that arch. That little niche, there's a lamp inside. Fiha misbah. Al misbahu fi zujaja. And then that lamp itself, you know, back in the day the lamps were not two, you know, bulbs. They were not bulbs. They were lamps that you have to light up like a candle, right? And the flame flickers. So what do you have to do to protect the flame? You have to put a glass around it. You put glass around it. And glass does a few things. One, it helps spread the light even more. So now there are two devices to spread the light. And two, of course, if it's windy or you have a fan on or something, the light's not going to go out. Incidentally, even bulbs today, aren't they surrounded by glass? Right? So Allah didn't let us change that much. Right? So al-misbahu fi zujaja. Now that, so Allah says it, the lamp is inside a glass. And I'm not explaining the parable yet, I'm just translating it so far. The glass itself is like a brilliant star. Wait, I thought the lamp was going to be a brilliant star. He says, no, not the lamp, even the glass around it, when it twinkles, it looks like a star. And then he says, durri. The word durri in Arabic, subhanAllah, one of the most uh, interesting words I found in this, in this parable, شَيْءٌ يُنِيرُ بِنَفْسِهِ Something that's lit on its own. It's almost as though it's got its light of its own. Even though the, la the, the glass itself is not something that's lit, but it's so pure and refined, it feels like it's got its own light. It's got its own shine. That's the glass around the lamp. Alright, moving along. كَوْكَبٌ دُرِّي يُقَدُ مِنْ شَجَرٍ Now this is, this is where things get really interesting. This lamp is now fueled. Because you can't just have a lamp back in the day, you have to have some oil inside there. Now the, instead of describing the oil first, Allah says actually it's fueled by a tree. Now tell me, this is very easy math, a science question for you. Where is the image of everything that's going on? Is that indoors or outdoors so far? Are we indoors or outdoors? We're indoors, thank you for being awake, very good. Now there's a, there's a niche, there's a lamp inside, and Allah says there's fuel inside that lamp. And that fuel comes from a tree. Tree is indoors or outdoors? It's outdoors. So Allah is making us leave the home and think about something outside. 
He's making us think, think about something outside. Fine. You know why that's important? I'll come back to it when I tie this all up together. Probably you'll remember nothing, but we'll see. I have high expectations from Canada. So, the idea is, this lamp is powered by something from the outside. Something from the outside is the source of its light. It's not itself. It is not itself. It's some tree outside. Now, min shajaratin mubarakatin, the first attribute of this tree is that it is, it's commonly translated as a, a blessed tree. But the word barakah in the Arabic language is a few things. I won't get into the linguistics of it, but it's increase. One of the meanings of it is increase. And the other is increase beyond expectation. The other meaning of barakah in the, in the root origin of the word is something that stays in its place. So, athabitu min min shay, right? So, something that's in its place is also something that has barakah. Now, what Allah is saying is its source is a stable tree. It's a tree that's constantly growing. It's a tree that whatever it gives, whether it's fruit or oil or extract, whatever this fruit, this tree gives, it gives beyond what you expected. You cannot codify it. You can't limit it to something like, I expect it to give this much. Every time you expect this much, it gives you more. So this lamp is lit by something that has no limits on its potential because its source is Mubarak. The source is Mubarak, okay? And I still haven't solved the riddle yet. I'm trying to build it for you so far. Now, he says, Mubarakatin zaytunatin. It is an olive tree. It's an olive tree. Why in the world an olive tree? You know, it's very interesting that in the Arabic language, the Arabic word for oil, oil itself is zayt. And the most refined kind of oil, the oil that the Arab is so obsessed with for millennia, that to this day, it cannot escape his dinner table. You cannot go to an Arab's house and not experience what? Olive oil. They, to them, when they think of oil, they, they think of zayt, they think of zaytun. And that's been there for thousands of years. That's why the word itself is the same. It's the same origin. Okay? They're tied together. So the most refined kind of oil, the oil that has the most diverse benefits, it can be consumed, it can be used to make food, it can be used to make sense, you can put it on your skin, you can make food, you know, fuel it, fuel your lamp with it. It has the most, most amount of benefits. And more, and then some. This is Zaytuna. But then Allah adds a strange, strange, strange description. He says, لا شرقية ولا غربية It's neither Eastern nor Western. Meaning the tree is not on the far end of one forest, on the Eastern end, not on the Western end. It's on its own. This tree is unique. And when the sun comes up from the East, it's hitting one side of the tree. And as the sun is setting, it's hitting the other side of the tree. So this tree is constantly being baked by the sun. It gets the full advantage of the, everything the sun has to offer. And those are the kinds of trees that give the best kind of oil. Okay, I'm gonna try to work back on my, my parable now. I just translated it thus far for you. To recap all of this so you don't lose your minds, Allah just said to appreciate His light, you can think of His light as a niche inside a wall. In a home. And by the way, when do you turn a lamp on? Night or, night or day? At night. No, no, not day, child. You must not be from a Desi family. No, no, no. Tawa, 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 tawa. Okay. So you turn the lamp on at night. But when you turn the lamp on, the light needs to be protected. So you have a glass around it. The glass itself is super brilliant. It looks like a star, it reminds you of a star. Now when the word star is used, where does that make you think? Sky, right? Makes you think sky. Then the oil itself came from the most powerful, you know, pure source. That is neither lean to the east nor to the west. It gets the most exposure from the sun. Let's work our way back. The human rib cage looks like a niche in a wall. This? looks like a mishkat. And Allah put inside it a little lamp. You know what that is? It's our heart. And inside that heart, Allah put a kind of fuel that is so pure, that could not have come from anywhere. Neither eastern nor west. And something that is directly, it was directly in contact with Allah Azza wa Jal, fully exposed to His light, like a tree that's fully exposed to the light of the sun. That's our ruh. We were directly in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. When He asked us, Alastu bi Rabbikum, qalu bala shahidna. We were directly in His presence. And so He took that pure fuel that made you who you are, that make you the lamp that you are, and He put that inside of you. 
He put that inside of you. That's who you are. You are actually in, at the core of you, at the core of me, there is light. And the purest kind of light. That's what that is. And now the glass around it is dirty or clean? It's clean, isn't it? What do you know about sins? When people do sins, what happens to their hearts? The glass starts getting dirty and dirtier and dirtier until it turns black. But you know what? Allah didn't give you a dirty heart to begin with. Unlike other theologies, we weren't born into sin. We were born into purity. Our hearts are clean. I mean, we let it get dirty sometimes. And you know what? If you do, if you do nothing with a lamp, if you never clean it, does it get dusty or no? It does. So it can't be on autopilot. You have to clean it yourself. The original is beautiful. But if you don't clean it, you're not gonna know. You're just not gonna know. So this light is inside of us, and this, this fuel is inside of us, and it hasn't even been lit yet. By the way, it hasn't been lit up yet. Allah is just describing the glass and the, you know, all of that, and no light yet. And He says, يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ It is almost as though its oil wants to jump and catch the fire. وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسْهُ نَارِ Even though fire hasn't even touched it yet. This is the kind of fuel that's saying, man, I'm so pure, I'm so flammable, just give me a match. Let me light this up. I need to do, I need to fulfill my purpose. You ever see like petroleum? It kind of feels like it's catching towards the flame. Don't try this at a gas station. But I'm just saying, right? The idea of it wanting to catch light, that's been captured by the end. And then Allah says, Noorun ala nur, light upon light. Now what in the world does that mean? It means a ton of things, but I just want to share a couple of things with you. So far we have a lamp inside of us that is amazing. It's got, it's lit on its own, but not fully. It's, even it's, it's glass is like a light. But when the light of revelation, when the light of wahi comes inside through our ears, when we see, when the Sahabi sees the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and the light goes through his eyes, and it goes into his heart, his heart already had the fuel, and one little spark, and boom, then you get light upon light. Nurun ala nur. The light of the fitrah, the light of the heart, meeting the light of wahi, the light of revelation. That is nurun ala nur. That's the passage of light. These two lights have to meet each other. Hey, I'm not done, stop that. Okay. Alright. You with me so far? So far so good? Now check this out. When do you turn the light on? I keep saying it so you remember because it's a really difficult physics question. When do you turn the lights on? Nighttime. Which means that the light that Allah provided, the sun, He's taken it away. And in the absence of that light, you are in need of a lamp. But that lamp was fueled by something that had a direct relationship with the sun. It was trained well by the sun. So that in the absence of the sun, the light can carry on. The believer and his heart is necessary for dark times. When the light of revelation is taken away, that you are left behind. You and I are the sources of light for the world now. This light is not just for you. It's for the neighborhood around you. It's for your family. What's the point of a lamp if it doesn't light up its surroundings? What's the point of it if it doesn't light up its surroundings? And as a matter of fact, Allah compared that lamp and the glass of it even to a star. And the star makes you think of the sky at night, doesn't it? Al-Razi rahimahullah commenting on this ayah said, Ahlu sama yanzuruna ila al-ard al-mutala'li'a wa ahlu al-ard yanzuruna ila sama al-mutala'li'a he said, the people of the sky, meaning the angels, look at the earth lit up by light. And the people of the earth, look at the stars lit up by light. You know what he's talking about? Not physical light. When your flight lands at nighttime, you see lights all over the earth? That's not the light the angels see. They see the light of the hearts of believers. They look at the earth and they can see light at nighttime. We look up at the sky and we see the sky, the, the light of the angels, subhanAllah. You know, it's such a beautiful parable. Especially for dark times. You know, we're not evil people, we're not bad people. Allah gifted us with something so pure and so refined. Someone says, man, I'm not capable of being a good person. Actually, you are, you are so capable of being a good person. You are actually inherently good and incredibly good at that. Not just good, incredibly good. These pas this passage to me was like, whoa, so I'm like lit up on the inside? 
How do I keep this fuel going? Because the fuel is not from inside, is it? The fuel had to come from outside and it needs to feed. You need to clean it. And that's why Allah gave us this revelation. Allah gave us this book so we continue to recite it and memorize it and reflect on it. And every time we do, the light gets a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger. That's what it does. يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسُنَا نُورٌ عَلَى نُورٌ Then Allah says, it's so beautiful. يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ So beautiful. Allah says, Allah guides all the way to His light, whoever He wants. Allah guides all the way to His light. In other words, right now, right now, Allah guided us to the light of this book, this revelation. The light of the sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah gave us the appreciation of the light we have inside of ourselves. He gave us that light. But you know what? On top of that, the lam here suggests al-ghaya. You can say in Arabic, yahdi ila. Yahdi Allahu ila nurihi. But he didn't say that. He said, yahdi Allahu li nurihi. This lam is used when you reach the nth conclusion. You know what that means? We say when the day, the day on which you and I, by Allah's permission and mercy, when we make it all the way to the, the gates of paradise, what are we gonna say? Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana li hadha. Wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Alhamdulillah, the one who guided us all the way to this. That guidance is captured with a lam. All the way to something. Allah is saying, if you keep this up, I will guide you all the way to my light. I will have you meet me. You can see my light one day. You can get to be in the company of Allah one day. يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ لَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ Allah. He says, and he gives examples for people. I was reading that part of the ayah and I said, Ya Allah, why'd you say that? Allah gives examples for people. It's like, oh, then he explained it himself. Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim. Allah knows everything. You know, a teacher, I'm in the profession of teaching. Uh, and the most difficult part of teaching is teaching children. And when you have to teach children, you have to give a lot of examples. You can't talk about, you know, just things as they are. You have to give example and example and example so they get it. Because children can't handle the, the straight up, you know, information. As a matter of fact, not even adults. I have to teach adults Arabic grammar. <laughs> it's not fun. So if I just say, you know, this is called a mubtada, and that's called a khabar, and this is called a muta'alliq, and this is this, and this. they're like, uh, I want to go home, you know. So I have to give examples. This guy came over here, we'll call him a mubtada. What are we gonna call him a mubtada? Then his friend came over. His name is khabar. They like to play with each other. There's an is in between them, you know. <laughs> They're like, ah, get it. I wrote it down. I drew the truck and, the, you know, <laughs> you know, they'll do that. But you know what? A teacher has to do that because if the teacher only speaks based on knowledge, which is what I began this problem with, as a matter of fact, you can learn a lot about Allah's book. If you don't teach it, if you don't give examples, if you don't simplify, people might not get it. So Allah Himself left the legacy of giving examples. So you can get, Allah says, the concept of light and what it really means. What you have inside of you and what it really means. What the light of revelation really truly is, is beyond you. But at least you can appreciate some things by an example and don't think that this is the limits of Allah's knowledge. Allah is just giving, Allah knows everything, this was for you. يَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ لَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ he says, Fi buyutin. And, and the, I'm almost done. I have six minutes left. Just wanted to make one last comment. And I want you to read this passage on your own because this is not only a passage about light, it's also a passage about darkness. As a matter of fact, in the six minutes and 20 seconds that I have left, I want to give you two things. I'll, I'll put myself on a timer, inshallah. Two things. One is Allah talks about homes and He used the word buyut, not diyar. Diyar is also places. But buyut comes from baytuta, to spend the night. Again, we go back to the parable of the night. Right? And in that He says, Allah, Allah, Allah allowed that those homes should be raised. The home is, your home is on the first floor. You might even live in the basement. But when you turn the lights on at night, and remember Allah at night, that Allah has raised your house without you even realizing it. And every house of Allah, every masjid is raised. And by the way, when are the lights of a masjid turned on? What are the three prayers when the light of a masjid are turned on? Come on, you guys got this. You got, I believe in you, I really do. 
Okay, Fajr, Maghrib, Isha. So the times the lights are turned on are when things are getting dark outside. And all the prayers that are, that are prayed in the dark, we recite Quran louder so the light spreads further. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So now, what are we learning from all this? It's really cool light stuff. But what does that all mean? That means that maybe we haven't been paying attention to something inside of ourselves. Maybe between all of the video games and the movies, maybe between all the TV shows, maybe between all the social media stuff, maybe between all the gadgets and the picture taking and all the... It's just the spending, killing time. Maybe we've been killing a light inside of ourselves. Maybe some of you really like to buy lamps and chandeliers and put up, you know, nicer lighting inside your homes. And you love the stores and the restaurants that have beautiful lighting. But you know what? You and I start need to worrying about lighting inside of ourselves a little more. And part of that is developing a relationship with the houses of Allah that Allah has granted us. Even in the lands that we did, nobody expected there are going to be masajid. Nobody expected. How many people are actually going to visit the masajid? And if you're going to complain to me, well, the masjid, our masjid's a little difficult. We've got a situation at our masjid. Uh, the women have a closet. And once my aunt goes in, nobody else can, etc., etc. You know? If that's your situation, you know what? You need to participate in your masjid even more. We talk about not being able to change dictatorships in the Muslim world. We've got some situations right here. And we, no, nobody's gonna change those for us. We have to go ourselves as families. We cannot give up on the houses of Allah. They are our homes. They are the homes built so we can preserve our light and the light of our children. And sometimes you have masajid. May Allah protect them. The masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was an incredibly, incredibly busy place. And all kinds of stuff was going on there. And if the same stuff uh, that was happening in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was happening in a masjid today, then people will say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, hadha masjid. And then you're supposed to say, exactly. This is a masjid. This is a place for the entire family. And you know what? The people who get angry at you, their children need it. They don't even realize. Let them be angry. It's okay. Don't be afraid of the anger of a few. But we need to revive the relationship of an entire family with the houses of Allah. We need to do this. This is critical. This is not just a side matter. Then on top of that, we need to revive the legacy of praying as a family. If you're not gonna go to the masjid, at least pray as a family in your homes. Turn the light on and pray. Wake up your children for fajr and pray. I know when your kids get a little older, you're like, ah, oh, let them sleep, they got school. Just let them sleep, it's okay, it's okay. You know, the husband tries to go wake them up, the wife stops him. The wife tries to go wake them up, the husband stops him. You know what? وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Give children a love of prayer. Not, don't make it something hateful to them. Make it something that they feel like their day was filled with light because they stood in front of Allah. Make it an event inside your home. Maghrib and Isha and Fajr at least. If you can't go to a masjid, turn your home into one. Turn your home. This is really important. This is how we preserve our light. This is how we do it as a family. You know? I, people are, we're, mashallah, you're here at this conference and you get a boost after this conference. But your real life as a believer, and my life as a believer, the real test of it is what happens inside the privacy of our homes. That's really where, it, that, that's what, what means something. You know? How many of us are praying together with our children? Some of you fathers, your children have never heard you reciting Quran. And that's a tragedy. And you say, I don't recite it properly. I don't care. You're not getting an ijazah in tajweed anytime soon. It's okay. Whatever you know, recite. Even that is light. It's not a floodlight. It's not a stadium light, but it's still light. It's still good. It's good enough. You know? Okay. Last, last comment about this thing. You know, Surah An-Nur is a surah that is filled with, some argue, 14 sections. And almost all of the sections have to do with Islamic law. It actually begins with the punishment of the zani, of the fornicator. It begins with that. And it goes on to many, many, many laws and regulations. Ahkam, ahkam, hukum, 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 hukum. And in the middle of all of this, there's a passage on light. 
In the middle of all of it is this passage. You know what that tells you? That tells you that without light, without iman, without that faith, that spirituality inside of you, those laws won't mean anything to you. You will not be able to see the benefit in them. You'll be stumbling on them and doing them and you won't even know why. A lot of sisters asked me, in, back in the US, they asked me, why don't you do a lecture on the hijab? Because some sisters don't wear it. And I said, I will not do a lecture on the hijab because some sisters don't wear it. I'll do a lecture on the ayah of khimar as it occurs in Surah An-Nur and my motivation for the ayah, oh, my time just about to run out, when I was getting to the juicy part. My motivation for the ayah is actually it belongs to Surah An-Nur because to Allah, all of those regulations, even the khimar, is a spiritual matter, not a social one, not a regulatory one. It has to do with the heart. That's what it has to do with. You know? This is, it's, it's an incredible realization when we look at the Qur'an in a holistic way. So my last comment, I know I'm 34, 35 seconds over, I'm gonna take exactly one minute over. Sue me. <laughs> you guys don't do that here, do you? Okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love RIS, I love it. Officially, okay. So Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Just this part. Men who two things don't describe, distract them from remembering Allah. Their business and sales. Now, sales are a part of business. When you do business, Sales are a part of business, but Allah separated them and said, men who their business and their sales don't distract them from the remembrance of Allah. We learn a few things from that. Number one, you're supposed to do sales. You're supposed to do business. Just don't you let it, what? Distract you from remembering Allah. We're supposed to be people of commerce. We're supposed to be people of careers. Allah is not saying that you fill up my houses and don't do anything else. Number one. Number two, when you do spend your time properly in the dhikr of Allah, everything else you do, like business, is going to be fine because you won't be distracted anymore. It'll give you balance in your life. You can be people of great careers. You can be without forgetting Allah though. That's it, you know, without, without remembering Allah, it won't, that career won't mean anything. So if you address the spiritual needs of your, of your life, then the career and material needs of your life will be filled with barakah. You won't imagine where the promotions come from, where the next you know, business opportunity comes from, because you're remembering Allah properly. Just because of that, subhanAllah. So you have, to, you have to realize Allah will open the doors of risk for you if you don't let yourself get... Distracted, and so on this I conclude, if you are in business, then you know that in business you have to pay taxes, and you guys pay a lot of taxes, you know. And then you have to do inventory, you have to do purchasing, you have to do payroll, you have to do all this stuff. Which is, a lot of it is just a headache. But there's one thing in business that makes it all worth it. There's only one thing in business, everything else is just, ugh. One thing, you know what it is? The sale. When the customer walks into the store and fills the cart with all the products, it's all worth it. When you have to write the check for your employee, it hurts you in the ribs. And it's very difficult. But when the, when the customer is writing you a check, or when he's counting the cash, oh, that's juicy. So Allah says, not only business distracts them, but even the juiciest part of business the one that makes it all worth it, which is what? The sale, even the sale doesn't get to them when it comes to remembering Allah. Because when you advance in your careers, it's gonna be Friday afternoon when your employer calls you in. Listen, I wanted to discuss your promotion with you, Muhammad. At 12.45, could you make it? Actually, I gotta go remember Allah. Mm. Some of you are gonna earn grocery, own grocery stores. Cust the best customer is gonna walk in right at Jum'ah time. Right at Jum'ah time. And he's just stuffing his card in and you're at the cash register like, oh, Salat or this or... And you're like, sir, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to close shop because I gotta go pray. And he says, what kind of customer services? I'm never coming back here again. And you know, it's okay. Wallahu khayrul raziqeen. Allah is the best provider. These people will not get distracted. You will not compromise. You will not let your career... You will not let your career get in the way of remembering Allah. And when you can do that, we'll be a different kind of people.
We will just be a different kind of people. May Allah pe- make all of us a people of light. May Allah Azza wa fill this gathering with light and put light in our hearts and strengthen it with His word and with the love of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah Azza wa continue to strengthen our light until we meet the ultimate light. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.